Hi, I'm Anne Flanoy from the Keller Public Library. I'm the new adult services librarian. And um, we want to thank you today for joining us for our flower pounding art class. Today we have with us Nancy Curl. She is with the Tarrant County Master Gardeners. And she's going to teach us how to make beautiful art um, from just some fabric and some fresh flowers. Um, I'm really excited about this. I'm pretty crafty, but this is something I've never done before. So I'm really excited to learn how to do it and to share it with all of you. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Nancy now, and she's going to teach us everything we need to know about flower pounding. I hope, or at least enough to get you started. Right. <laughs> Welcome. I am just thrilled to death to know that so many people are interested in this. Um, this is actually a botanical craft that you can do by yourself with friends. You can do it with kids, grandkids. It's really, really easy to do. It doesn't take a whole lot of uh, materials, so I'm excited to be able to share it with you. Uh, before we begin, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about water conservation, which uh, sounds kind of odd because I know it's been raining uh, in some locations around Tarrant County, but uh, the Tarrant County Master Gardeners have a collaboration with Tarrant Regional Water District, and we uh, feel uh, compelled to share their message about water conservation. And I'm going to show you a couple of, whoops, I think I need to, uh, Anne, if you can allow me to share the screen again. Uh, whoops. Okay. There we go. All right, I'm going to show this up on my screen. I'm sorry, my computer is. Here we go. I uh, just wanted to let you know that the water supply that you receive from your faucet um, is probably purchased through the Tarrant Regional Water District. And this uh, location serves the water needs for about um, several million people across 11 counties. Most of them are in Tarrant County. Uh, cities include Fort Worth, Arlington, Mansfield, uh, Trinity River Authority, as well as many others. There are four major reservoirs where we receive the water from. That's Lake Bridgeport, Eagle Mountain, Cedar Creek Reservoir, and Richland Chambers. About 80% of our water does come from East Texas. The reason this is important for you to have an understanding of is if you look at this map of our area right in here, uh, Tarrant and Dallas, we live in this area, but if you look to see where these lakes are located, where we receive our water, Lake Bridgeport is all the way to our north, Eagle Mountain, Lake Worth, Lake Benbrook, and then all the way to our south is Richland Chambers and Cedar Creek. And you have to think about the amount of energy and the size of the pipes that it takes to move all of that water up into Tarrant County to finally get it to your faucet. So when you see an increase in your water bill, many times it's because of the amount of energy that it takes to move that water from one location to the next. Think about uh, in the next 50 years, we're going to uh, more than double our population from 1.8 million to 3.6 million. You know, everybody loves North Central Texas and they wanna come here, but our challenge is, is that the amount of water that we have is finite, but the amount of the population, the number in the population is going to continue to grow. So things that we can do to make sure that our water is still there when we need it, is to think about how you use your water in your home as well as outside in your landscape. If you look at a lot of the videos and gardening videos, they're talking about uh, uh, water conservation and drought tolerant plants, but you can still landscape in your yard and make it beautiful and not have a high water bill. So we're gonna move on to flower pounding. And flower pounding is a fun activity. It's a, a botanical art. Um, I've been doing this probably for about 12 years and first got interested, I used to be the education person uh, for Master Gardeners for the women at Union Gospel Mission. And we were always searching for uh, botanical things or gardening activities that didn't take a whole lot of uh, material and they didn't take a lot of time to do and the ladies could enjoy um, as they were working through their issues there at uh, the, the mission. And so over the years, um, I've presented this classes numerous times. I you know, work on it every year. Sometimes it's a little um, time specific uh, because I like to use plants that are in my yard and that are growing out. We live on about three acres west of town. And so when the wildflowers are blooming, I like to go out and gather them and, and see what kinds of things I can do. And, you know, my husband's always excited because he sees me pulling out the, the board and the hammer and he knows what's getting ready to happen. <laughs> so he heads out to his barn so he doesn't have to listen to it or I move outside. 
But the first thing you need to do is uh, decide what you want to uh, put this, uh, put these flowers onto. So this is a preservation of the flower itself. So and the coloring within it. You might preserve your flowers, um, you know, pressing them from a special event. This is a way to extend their beauty by maintaining the color, not always the true color, but the essence of the color, sometimes the essence of the flower itself, the stems and even the leaves as well. So you can use either paper, and those of you that picked up a packet, you received a couple of 12 inch squares and some practice squares as well. That fabric has been treated. Um, I personally like to use muslin. I use 100% cotton. My preference is for bleached, just so the colors will come out a little bit sharper. I have in the past used un uh, unbleached muslin, which has a little bit of a yellowing to it. And if you like that older look, there's nothing wrong with it. It's just my personal preference it happens to be the bleached version of it. So uh, you can also use the, the paper that you have is a, uh, a watercolor paper. It's not a fine uh, watercolor paper. So the plant itself, if you put that onto the card, you will be able, again, to get some color. You'll be able to get the print out. Um, if you use a higher grade of watercolor paper, it'll probably not uh, smoosh out quite as much, my technical terms here. So the first thing you want to do if you're using fabric is you want to prepare your fabric. And I believe everyone uh, has received a, uh, a how-to on how, uh, how to prepare your fabric and a list of plants and things like that. So I'm going to refer to that. And you can see in this slide the things that you need are washing soda, um, alum, you can purchase it in this small container. You can find this in the grocery store um, where the spices are. Um, I usually purchase large quantities of it because I'm usually doing like a bolt or you know just larger pieces um, for projects that I'm working on. Just a measuring spoon, measuring cup, and gloves and a mask are helpful and I'll explain why in just a minute. So the first thing you want to do with your fabric and if you buy I would advise that you buy about a yard of it, but if you want more, go ahead and do it. But when you're treating it, you want to treat it about a yard at a time, or you want to change the ratio from what is listed on the instruction sheet. So as it tells you to prepare the fabric, you're going to pre-wash it to remove the sizing. And to do that, you're going to put it in your washing machine with regular washing detergent and then two tablespoons of this washing soda right here. You can purchase the washing soda at any regular store um, where their detergent is, whether it's a grocery store, Albertsons, Kroger's, um, even Walmart carries this. You're gonna let that wash through a regular cycle. You want to rinse it a couple of times because you want to rinse that washing so or that soda out of the fabric as best you can. Then you're going to take that fabric out of the washing machine and you're gonna place it in a bucket or a container and you're going to uh, let this soak for two hours. And what you want to do is have two cups of really hot water that one quarter of alum has been stirred into and blended into. And you pour that, I put my fabric down in here, and then you pour that on top of that fabric. And I usually use tongs or I've got my gloves on, and I'll slosh that fabric around, make sure that the alum is being saturated within that fabric. You let that sit for at least two hours. And then you're going to add another half a cup of, wa of hot water with one teaspoon of washing soda that has been mixed into that. And then you're going to want to put your mask on. I started reading about a couple of years ago that when alum and washing soda are combined, that it can generate a little bit of, uh, I hate to say fumes, but you know it'll be a little bit of a mist that wouldn't necessarily be good for your lungs. So you would want to put a mask on just so you're not inhaling that if you're sitting there kind of moving that fabric around within the bucket. So you're going to let that soak for about a minimum of eight hours. I usually let mine sit overnight. And then you take it out of the bucket and I take mine out and hang it up. I usually just hang mine up outside and I don't uh, rinse it out. I just let that alum and washing soda stay absorbed within the fabric and let that drain naturally. Then the next day it's going to be dry and I take it in and I press it. And because it's helpful if you have the fabric as flat as possible when you're ready to pound the flowers onto it. And then I cut them into pieces that I'm going to be working with and that's what you then have in your packet. So the tools that you need to be uh, to get started with flower pounding are really pretty simple things that you can find around your house. Um, you can use a cutting board um, or I now use blocks of wood and the only reason I do that is because I've done numerous classes and 
I don't have that many cutting boards. So if you're going to use your cutting board, even if you're going to piece of, use a piece of wood, I would recommend that you cover it in wax paper and then just take the back of it. And the reason you're doing that is when you start pounding these flowers, crushing the color out of them, it's going to bleed into the fabric and then it can also bleed into your cutting board or the wood. Now, it's not so terrible if you don't mind having that color onto your cutting board, but sometimes that color, if you're then moving on to another piece of fabric, sometimes that color that's on the board can then be transferred back onto the next piece of fabric. <coughs> Excuse me, so if you want all of that to stay white and ready until you get started, um, that's the reason for the wax paper over. Then the next thing you're gonna need is you want some pruners or a pair of scissors to be able to cut your materials with. And then you want some uh, tape. You can use painter's tape, you can use masking tape, anything to make sure that you put it down onto your fabric so it doesn't move around and you'll be able to keep it where you have placed it onto that fabric or onto the uh, paper that you're using. And then you need a hammer and just go out. I am probably have a uh, work drawer or maybe you can pill for something out of your husband's toolbox um, and you can use either a ball peen hammer or a claw hammer. Um, you can even use a spoon. Uh, the back of a spoon does work. It's a little bit more uh, labor intensive because you have to have a lot of pressure to push onto that to get the coloring out of those plants. And then I keep a uh, marker, a permanent marker with me. Sometimes some of the uh, plants that I do, I like to enhance the shape of those. And so therefore I'll use a marker, whoops, i use a marker to um, just enhance the uh, design or the shape of that. And then sometimes I'll fill some things in and I'll show you that in a little while as well. And then I keep paper towels handy as well. Uh, sometimes uh, plants or flowers that I've pulled up, they may have a little bit of dew on them because you want them to be as dry as possible. It's not good to try to go get them right after the rain. Um, and so I'll uh, kind of shake those out and dry those out onto the uh, paper towel. Uh, just real quick to show you a couple of books that I use as a resource and reference material. One is The Art and Craft of Pounding Flowers. I really love this book. I just happened upon it um, and found it on Amazon. And um, it gives you a lot of ideas on what to do because you create these botanical designs. They're original prints. Um, that you created and then you're like, well, what do I do with it now? Well, you could certainly frame it and create a picture or you can create a card, but you could also use that as fabric to then make things. So this great book here on the left, this, uh, The Art and Craft of Pounding Flowers is a great one to consider. Um, I do not get any kickbacks from this book at all. It's just a book that I found helpful and you might as well. And if you're a quilter, this other book, The Flower Pounding uh, Quilt Projects, um, may be helpful to you as well. It will give you ideas on how to incorporate uh, fabric that has been pounded with flowers into a quilt project um, and then how to extend the life of that project as well. So selecting plant material, um, you know I've got a picture here that shows these are just some wildflowers. This was taken earlier in the year, um, early spring when these things were all ballooning out in my yard. We've got some larkspur and some salvias. There's a, a purple coneflower. This is Althea and uh, Rose of Sharon. And this is another purple larkspur. And this beautiful stem right here, this is actually the top of an asparagus plant. When asparagus is finished, um, when you finished harvesting asparagus and the top of the plant starts bolting, um, this is what you get. It's this beautiful, very, um, beautiful fern-like top and it creates a beautiful image onto fabric when you're ready to go. I uh, just also want to refer you to the handout that you received that gives you a listing of plant materials, but please don't let that limit what you decide to try. Um, you're only limited by the plants that you have at your location that you grow for your own pleasure, or maybe plants or flowers that you see somewhere else that you might decide to take home. I just would caution you that make sure that you ask permission before you pick any flowers or any other leaf material. But there's lots of things out there and most people usually won't mind you just taking just one to, to take it home. So I'm gonna show you uh, through these slides, the process, and then we're gonna do some real time as well. So this particular plant is um, 
uh, Mexican bird of paradise. And this is the leaf, you know, one of the stems off of the Mexican bird of paradise. And you can see these are the flowers up here. And if you've ever seen one, it has these little wispy things that come off of it, but it has this beautiful leaf on it. So I just decided to try the leaf. I've laid it and I placed all of these. I didn't pick the rest of it apart. I just took one of the stems, laid it out onto the fabric, and then laid out the uh, leaves and the other smaller stems the direction that I wanted them to go. And then I put tape over that. So you can see that this has a couple of, I like to use wide masking tape so I can get a lot of it on there. And you can see that the, uh, the leaf is there underneath it. Now, I personally typically will lay the leaf or the flower face down, but it's not necessarily what you have to do. Some plants, you can put it on the back if you want like the veining more of it. So again, this is something you may have to experiment with just a little bit once you feel more comfortable with what you're doing and practicing. So I have this taping down and then I'm gonna pick up my hammer, I'm gonna start hammering it. And I will hammer on both sides of the fabric where the tape is and then I will flip it over and I will hammer on the back. And as I'm hammering, I'm going to start seeing the color and you can see it here. You can see the color that has come out, that has leached out of, I've been able to pound out of this leaf and out of the stem. This is the tape that I've pulled back from where the print is left on the fabric. And you can see that there's a print left on the tape as well. So this is another one. Um, this is a purple cone flower. And I'll, we'll talk a little bit more. I'll show you some different flowers. You need to take a look at the flower. And some flowers, you know, are uh, fairly flat in shape. Others have kind of a conical or they have different layers to it. So you may be better served by deconstructing that flower or leaf or basically taking it apart, especially with something like a purple cone flower. It has this huge seed head, which you know, you're not necessarily going to want all of that, but you might, you may come up with a different idea than I've ever thought of. So I chose to take this flower apart and you can see I've done all of these separate leaves, or excuse me, separate petals, and I've separated them out. Now this has a, not a huge petal count, but it has more than you know, six or seven. So I may have to do this in steps, in phases. So what I would do is I would totally cut these all apart and you can see that I've laid these onto the fabric. I've spread them out because my plan is to come back and layer these in just a minute. So I've covered this with tape. I'll start pounding the color out of it. And then this is actually a result. So this has been layered probably about three times and it looks like it has a lot of petals from that original flower. And the other thing that you might notice is that it's not the same color that the original flower was. The original flower, that purple cone flower, we call it purple cone flower, but it's really more of a, sometimes they're kind of fuchsia in color, if you can see this one. But the color that actually comes out of it when I'm pounding the color out of that onto the fabric comes out more as a, as a purple. And sometimes they're deep purple, sometimes lavender. It all depends on what the flower is that you're using and what color it will come out. This is a um, tropical hibiscus, and it's still, this one's still blooming out on my patio. This has a high, high petal count. That means there's lots and lots of petals um, within this flower. And so I definitely am going to want to deconstruct this one. And you can see I've cut all of this apart. I've taken all of this away. <clears throat> the other reason is I'm cutting these apart is that I don't necessarily want all of the other pieces of this flower onto my print just yet. I may at a later time come back and add that, but for now all I really want are the petals. So I'm going to do basically the same thing. I laid those down and I taped over them and then I started hammering. So this is actually the result of that tropical hibiscus. Look back. Here is a, it's kind of a salmon color and then the end of that again becomes kind of a more beautiful purple. And you're looking at different shades of the color and the flower that's in here. These darker pieces, these dark, darker color right here, that is actually plant material that became embedded within that fabric as I was pounding that onto that. Now I didn't try to put it back into its original shape. Um, my choice was to lay this out so I could see the beautiful feathering. I like to see the ends of the petals, but again, that's my choice. That's how I like to look at these things. 
sometimes I'm not necessarily interested in the color of the plant or the flower. I'm really interested in the veining and what, what I can see out of that particular flower or plant. Um, so this was the uh, purple cone flower. This is the tropical hibiscus. And this plant right here, this is a St. John's wort. If you're familiar with this plant, it's a yellow bloom. And these are the actual leaves that came off of the plant. And again, leaves come out just really amazingly. So the St. John's wort uh, bloom is a, a kind of an awkward bloom as well. If you think about it, it's kind of fluffy at the top. It has these little um, things that, that shoot out. And uh, so I wanted to capture some of those. So I can't get really close on here, but um, if you could see this up close, you would see that I laid those down and I carefully put those in there because I wanted that to be a part of the end product that I was trying to hammer out of this. So this is the result of that Mexican bird of paradise. And we talked about that bloom as well, have these little spiky things that come out that when I put them on the fabric and hammer them out, you know, it almost looked like a squid or a, uh, you know, an octopus or something, which I thought, for me personally, I thought it was totally fascinating. But again, that's up to you. Um, we're gonna come back here. I'm gonna come back to real time. Okay, I'm back. <laughs> So what we're going to do is we're going to do some real-time um, flower pounding. And so here I have an assortment um, on my table here. This is the tropical, hardy, uh, tropical hibiscus, and you can see it has a lot of petals in it. And so what I would have to do to use this is I would cut the bottom of it, I would cut out the stamens inside, and then I would have to individually take each of these petals apart. Uh, this is another purple cone flower. I have a few, and you can see it has quite a few petals on it. And again, I would do the same thing with this one. With my pruners, I would take these apart and just cut each one of those. And I don't have to use all of them. I mean, again, this is personal preference. So as I have those, one other thing that may be helpful if you can see it is a pair of tweezers. I don't think I mentioned that. But sometimes, depending on the plant that you're using, sometimes tweezers can be helpful. So I think Anne's gonna, Anne, if you wanna go ahead and grab a flower and um, put one on your, on your fabric. And if you have your plants and your fabric at home, you can certainly try this now. I may have to mute me when I start pounding. So I'm gonna lay these out. Now again, this is personal preference. You know, you can uh, do every other one. You can com combine plants, combine flowers, combine colors. Um, it's certainly up to you. Once I have those placed on there, I'm gonna take my tape. I'm gonna take those down because I don't want them to move. So what I've done, if you can see that, I've completely taped this and you can kind of see it on the other side as well. So from this point, I am going to start hammering or pounding. If it's too loud, you can mute me. So you can see on the back, the color is starting to come through. So I will go ahead and I will pound on both sides so I can get all the color out. You know, I talked about different types of hammers. And sometimes the ball peens and even a regular hammer has a different, sometimes it'll have a design on the head and that can actually help you create a design when you're counting the flowers in as well. I can hear my dog in the other room, he's not happy with me. So I think I've got most of the color out of here. So what I'm gonna do is I'll pull this back and we'll do a reveal. So this is the color that I got out. Now, usually I like to pound the snot out of these things because I want every inch of color that I can possibly get out of here. Here's another plant that I like to use. This is a bougainvillea and bougainvillea I'm not actually going to be using the flowers because, you know, the flowers are the little yellow things down there. I'm actually going to use the petals, or excuse me, the bracts. But I still want to cut this apart. And so 
I'm cutting it. So I'm going to lay this out. I'm putting it, I choose to put it face down. That's the way I like it, but you can do either direction. Now, if you've got several petals, if you start layering them too much, you could end up uh, mushing your colors. I know that's such a technical term, but the colors just start com uh, combining and you don't get a really good uh, distinct pattern and you don't get a good color for this. So I lay these out. And again, I'm gonna do the same thing. Whoops, that one's on the back side. <clears throat> so I see Anne is there pounding hers. <laughs> and I hope you're pounding yours as well. <laughs> What'd you get, Anne? Look at that, gorgeous color. You might notice that I have a towel underneath my board. Um, it will help me to the noise a little bit. Right now, this is the bougainvillea, and so we're going to pull off and reveal this. So, what do you notice about the bougainvillea? It's a little bit more true to color. It is one of the flowers that I have discovered that will actually, you know, this was a, you know, kind of a fuchsia colored uh, brack bougainvillea, and when I put it onto the fabric, that's about the color that I receive as well. So, some of the other colors that come out fairly true to color are. Um, uh, petunias, you know, those will come out fairly true to color. Um, anything yellow, pretty much anything yellow will come out true to color. Uh, this is a little Zexmania, and it's got cute tiny little petals. And again, I would totally cut this thing apart and, you know, lay these out. Sometimes it can take a little bit of uh, a little while, so you do have to have a little bit of patience. And I try to take, if there's other plant material uh, that's trying to stay attached to those blooms, I try to take those off just because I don't want that muddy look. Uh, but again, that's my preference. You certainly can create the art that you wish um, that pleases you. That's how I feel about art is that, um, you know, I'm not necessarily, of course you want something to be beautiful and pretty, but uh, you know, I, I try, if I think it's pleasing, then I'm hoping that the person I'm going to give it to will find it pleasing as well. I'm gonna do this one quickly. So we hope that you will be uh, typing in some questions for us on uh, when you're actually seeing this. Um, we're pre-recording this, and then um, uh, Ann and I will both be available to answer questions for you on uh, next Tuesday when you're viewing this video. All right, let's see if we can get this done. This Zex Mania has a cute little um, tip to it on the edge of the petal. And I'm trying to make sure that we can get that as well. And I'm going to go, I showed you earlier the uh, um, asparagus that has uh, uh, bolted. Get some color out of this one, and then we're going to do the asparagus. So this is. Uh, Zexmania, which is a little yellow bloom, and it doesn't look like much, but it's got the yellow, it's kind of like dim there, I'm not sure if you can see it, but I'll show you what I'll do with that here in just a minute. Let's go ahead and do a couple pieces of the, uh, <clears throat> of the asparagus. 
Now you can do ferns. Um, there's all kinds of plants that you can use. It's really just, again, whatever you would like to experiment. Um, <coughs> you're only limited by your imagination. All right, so I have taped this. This is the uh, piece of asparagus. You can see that. And so I've taped that down. You can certainly use um, You know, I have a tendency to start on the tape side, and then as the color is starting to come through, I will turn it over to the uh, back side. And the reason is I can then see if I, <coughs> excuse me, want more color out of this plant, I know that I'm getting it. If it's coming through to the back side, I know that I'm getting all of that out of there. So I'm going to take this one off, and you can see the asparagus leaf up there. I don't know if you can see that very well. Can you see that? Kind of. <laughs> so um, when I'm creating these, like I said, I usually keep a permanent marker with me. And a lot of times what I'll do is I'll come in and I'll initial it on the front side so I can be reminded which is the front and which is the back. <laughs> so um, like these bougainvillea, I'm going to show you what I do with these. And again, this is personal preference. I wouldn't, you know, certainly wouldn't require you to do this um, unless you want to. But if you will take a marker on some of you, you don't have to do them on all of them unless you choose to. I'm doing this kind of fast. But if you will put the marker in there, you can see that it will enhance the shape of the plant and can you see that there we go is that better can you see that oh, where's my line okay so you can see that it will enhance the shape of the of the pattern as well so what else have you done ann did you try uh, so i did it i think it's an astralamarian all right um, but the bloom is like this kind of dark uh burgundy color almost and then it came yeah. this uh purple yeah. Have, uh, there's not too many colors that I found that will come out red. Um, like I said, sometimes um, the petunias will if it's a deep red, um, you know, but most of the time they come out as a purple. But the bougainvillea, you know, I can get a red out of that one. So I would just encourage you to um, experiment. Um, again, depending on what flower, you can see I have a bouquet here and I think yeah. in those as well. You know, there, you know, this is a, a sunflower, which would create a, a magnificent, and probably when I'm done with the video, I'll probably do the, the sunflower. But that one will definitely have to be taken apart. It'll have to be deconstructed because it has a lot of petals to it. If I try to put all of those down at the same time, I'm not going to get a good definition of those plants in there as well. Um, you know, and I have different sizes as well. You know, I even have some white blooms in here, but I would um, suggest that white does not come out very well. Um, I'm going to move back to my PowerPoint and show you some uh, things that I've done in the past, and then I'm going to show you what you can do with the materials, uh, some projects like I have at the back of me. So hold on just a second. Let me see if I can get down here to share screen again. And we'll, okay. All right, so um, as I've said, you can do flowers, you can do leaves, you can do stems. Um, this particular project I did when I presented the, uh, the Brit uh, class um, last year, we went out into the prairie and so I had some blades of grass that had seed heads, there were wood violets. And again, for me, it was about the shape, not necessarily all of the color. Of course, the leaves and the stems typically will give me green that will be coming out of that plant. The colors of the flowers sometimes surprise me as to what comes out of there. But I felt this was beautiful with seed heads that came out of this. You can actually see what those look like. Um, you know, I did this in several phrases, uh, phases. You know, I, I would put the bottom layer down and hammer that out and then pull that off. And then I would put another layer down and hammer that out as well. Um, you can see the wood violets. I did go ahead and use my marker again just because I wanted to emphasize the shape of the plant. 
I have a tendency to label what that plant is when I'm doing these, just because a lot of times people will ask me what it is, and this helps me to remember. So this is an example of a white plant, a white flower, and what happens to it when you put it on fabric. This was uh, a Rose of Sharon uh, Althea, and this was a white bloom with a red center. And this is, this is pretty old. This is probably one of the first ones that I did. And you can see that it came out kind of a yellow. It did give me a little bit of color, but you know, fortunately it didn't just give me white, it gave me a little bit of color. And then the red didn't come out red, it came out with this dark purple. And again, I made the decision to outline the petals just so I could distinguish those as I'm looking back at them. These are some other practice things that I've done and sometimes they're successful, sometimes they're not. You can see the pink, this was a pink petunia, didn't give me a, a color. My obedient plant was pretty disastrous. And then the impatiens, I love the leaves, wasn't so crazy about the, uh, the petals, but it came out as an interesting pattern. And for me, that was one of the things that I was looking for. Other things that I've done, this is a purple fountain grass. And again, it gave an interesting pattern. It showed me the definition of the stem. Um, and it get, certainly gave me the purple that was within that that stem. So this is an actual um, asparagus, um, you know, one of the asparagus tips on there. Um, again, these are other blooms that I've done. Some were more successful than others, but sometimes you just have to practice. This is one that um, I wasn't sure what color it would come. I think it was pink. Um, this actually came out of my mother's uh, garden, and it's a tropical hibiscus, but the thing that was fascinating to me was that it showed me the definition of the plant. You know, this is really this bloom that is, you know, marked into this fabric that will keep for a long, long time. And what's gorgeous about it to me is it shows me the, you know, the imperfections of the petals. It shows me what the design is within. This is all this veining that was actually within this plant. This was done in two parts. So we laid one, I laid one uh, plant down, I had taken it apart and put it down petal by petal and then pounded that and then came back and did the second one on top of it so I could get a second uh, image on there. Again, these are others just practice things that I've used. Um, you know, yarrow was not su successful. Here's an actual asparagus, asparagus fern. It looks a little bit different than the tip of an asparag asparagus, um, but it still has that kind of leafy look to it. You can see marigold comes out with a deep color, larkspur, the blues come out um, pretty true. And then here was kind of a, a pink of the begonias um, and purple of the begonias, I'm sorry, and petunias. Um, sometimes I will take a, a flower and look at it and try to figure out how I can put that on the fabric. And a daylily is one of them. So this one down here, this was an orange and yellow daylily. And if you think about a daylily, it's, you know, almost shaped kind of like, <clears throat> excuse me, this uh, Rose of Sharon where it kind of has this um, cup look. And so you have to be able to take those things apart, um, which is what I did. And so trying to piece these things back together, I just came up with a pattern that was pleasing to me. But what I found fascinating was when the colors came out, again, they were purple and yellow, but they almost looked like feathers. And, you know, this was from a daylily but it came out with such an unusual pattern and it just fascinated me uh, to no end. So this is a mesquite leaf. You know, sometimes they're a little woody um, and that's, I would caution you. You want to look, if you're going to do stems or leaves, you don't want anything that is too thick, um, like a, uh, you know, anything that, that's fleshy, like a cacti or a succulent, they would not be a good choice unless you're going to slice that and just use a piece of it. Because if you think about those plants, they have a lot of moisture that are within those leaves that are just going to bleed all over your fabric. So think about and look at the stems and the leaves that you want to use as well. So these are, uh, this one up here is Indian paintbrush. And if you think about uh, Indian, or excuse me, Indian blanket, you know, those are really, um, orange with yellow tips. I've got a late one right here that was still blooming in my yard, um, but they come out with this deep purple and they, uh, and then they have the yellow tips. So this right here, this was a seed head again that I found out in the field and it was pretty thick. It was pretty dense and I was kind of worried about 
um, what it would do when I got it onto the fabric, but I thought, you know, no guts, no glory, you just need to try it. And so I put it down, and again, I was rewarded with this fabulous imprint of this seed head. You can see all of the little uh, wings on it here that when the seed head would actually dry, these things would come apart and the wind or an animal or human animal would take these away. But this one was still fairly green and I was able to get some color out of it. And that's the other thing is that when you're looking at your plants and your flowers, you don't want anything that is too old. Um, if you've had something blooming out in your yard, um, you want to look to make sure that it's fairly fresh. If it's been sitting there for a long period of time, it may not have much color left in it. It's just not gonna have a lot of moisture in it. Um, this is a skeleton leaf golden eye. It had a very interesting, you know, and pick one today, has a very interesting leaf pattern, so you can see that, um, to it. And I wanted to see what that would look like on fabric. And again, I was rewarded this with this very interesting looking um, leaf pattern. This one was done in layers. Um, I deconstructed the top of the bloom and it came out with its true yellow. And then I layered the stems or the leaves down on top of it. I would do a few, I would press those out, tape them down, hammer them out, and then I would come back and do another layer as well. Um, these are, uh, this was Mexican hat. And if you think about Mexican hat, it has a really tall uh, seed head. And so I wanted a little bit of that on the plant. So I just cut a few of the seed heads off and I mushed those down in there. This is another one where I enhanced the pattern of the petal with the um, pin just so I could see the outline of it. And then this is the true leaves and the stem of the Mexican hat as well. Down here we have some oxalis and these came out uh, really true to color. This actually, I have a really large oxalis that has a pink center to it. And it came out very, very interesting. Um, again, these are some other patterns that we did. Again, these are the uh, bougainvillea. Um, you know, we've got some leaves that came out of it. And, you know, other plants that do very well. This was a pansy. It was a yellow pansy that came out really well. A little viola. Uh, dianthus. This was, I think, a dark red dianthus that came out more of a bluish color. But again, it had really interesting uh, leads to it and an interesting pattern. So sometimes you're not just looking for the color, but you also see the pattern on it. Again, here's another daylily. This one, I took all of the petals all off of it and spread them around so I could see the full, uh, full bloom of the flower. And again, this was an orange and yellow, which gave me the color of purple and yellow. This is, um, I have some uh, native poinsettia in my yard. And I always find the leaves very interesting on this. And so that's what I was looking for when I pounded these out. And the very center of the native poinsettia is a salmon color. It's not the red um, of the, uh, when we think of the Brax for uh, a Christmas poinsettia. So this one came out a little bit light, but if you look really, if you look into that, you can see a little bit of color in there. Um, this was a Texas star hibiscus. Um, again, I deconstructed this or took it apart because I wanted to see the different pieces of it. It's not that lovely, you know, the center of a Texas hibiscus is, uh, a Texas star hibiscus is white. So the colors kind of came out a little bit muddy. But again, I was enjoying the pattern. Again, you can see the veining that's within the petals of the flower. So to me, that was what was interesting about this particular plant. This is um, a piece of fabric, uh, one of the very first that I did like 10 or 12 years ago. And this is actually the unbleached muslin. So this is what it would look like. But what's interesting to me is that if you look at some of these flowers that I did that very first year, they're still pretty true to color. Um, they, uh, these were just some cut flowers that I put in here. They were orange and they've kept their true colors and even the leaves have as well. So I'm gonna come back up here. I think that's the end of and then here's my email. If you have any specific questions, you're certainly welcome to email me um, or certainly, you know, share with your questions um, when you're seeing this real time. We're going to come back to real time. So, Anne, what, how, what have you been doing? So, I have a, um, a ginkgo biloba tree in my yard. So I oh, cool. Oh, I love those leaves. Yeah. Wow. They actually look a little better in person. 
That is beautiful. The only thing is I found it was very, like I had to hammer it a lot to get it to release the color. Yeah, sometimes um, some are not as forthcoming as others. So, but I think that Bobo, don't they, isn't it a little waxy? Is it kind of a yeah. leaf? Yeah, yeah. Um, so sometimes they don't want to give it up. I do have a question about it though. So yep. um, my favorite thing about this tree is that the leaves turn to that bright autumn gold in the fall. And if I hammered it when it was gold, what do you think that would do? You know, the answer is I don't know because I've never tried that particular leaf. What I would okay. suggest you do is save some of your fabric or I'll send you some more and uh -huh. try it. Um, the, pro the challenge may be, the answer is I don't know. You'll just have to experiment with it. Okay. Um, it. It's possible that it will give you some of that gold color, but it's also possible that because those leaves are changing, that the color is fading out of that leaf and yeah. you might not be able to get any at all. But again, no guts, no glory. You just need yeah. to give it a try. So, all right. All right. So at this point, I'm not sure how much time we have. Um, I wanted to show you some things that, so does everybody feel comfortable with that they could do this? Anne's been doing it all along, so she feels comfortable. <laughs> what I want to do at this point is I want to show you um, what you can do with the fabric um, that you've, this print, this beautiful original print that you've created. So um, I'm going to show you this one right here. So this is that, uh, let me put it on here. <clears throat> this was the bleached muslin, or excuse me, the unbleached muslin that I used about 10 or 12 years ago. And you can see it's just a little bit yellower in color. And it just depends on what kind of look, you know, that you like for whatever you plan on doing with your things. So what I have behind me, um, so I create lots of prints. I'm going to show you this one. This is a uh, hardy hibiscus. And this was a uh, pink bloom. And so when I hammered this bloom, it gave me green with purple in the middle because I sometimes have a red in the middle. But again, I was fascinated by the pattern of the petals and the imperfections of the edges. And I just found it fascinating. So one way to increase the uh, duration of these, because you have to remember, the, this is actual, this is an actual plant that has been embedded into this fabric. And so one of the questions that I usually get is, how long will these last? And so the answer is, it depends. Um, they're not going to be washable in this condition. Even though once you're finished, and Anne, I need to remind you of this, once you've finished and yours has dried, you're going to want to heat set that. And just, I just use my iron. You can use a pressing cloth over the top of it. Some people put it in the dryer. I prefer to just hand iron it. Um, but just put a pressing cloth over it so you don't scorch it or anything. And then that will set the collar in there. <clears throat> and then like any other natural dye, if you keep it out of direct sunlight, it's going to last a lot longer than it would. So one of these prints I created, I made, and I used the fabric, and then I made it into a pillow. And so this is the actual uh, hardy hibiscus. You know, these have really... You know, like dinner size plate blooms and this is just a little throw pillow not necessarily something i want people putting their heads on and putting their body oils it's going to be more for show but it's just a really you know one thing that you can do and i will let you know that some of the little bits on here see how close i can get you can see some of the darker pieces that's still pieces of that flower that are embedded into that fabric and over time as you touch it some of that will come off just a little bit um, some of the other things that I like to do, I, I got into um, making little bags. And so, you know, I would use these prints and then I would put them together. This is a uh, dill. And, I'm sorry, it's fennel. And so, you know, I just create these little zippered bag things. But again, I've used a, an original print. No one else is going to see this. No one else has this. And I just had fabric that I put it together and then I'll give these out as gifts to friends. Uh, one thing, again, getting back to how long will the color last, I want to show you a difference. So both of these are uh, the top of an asparagus plant. And the one right here, this was one of the very first ones that I did probably, again, about 10 or 12 years ago. And you can see that the print is still there. You can tell what it is, but it's really kind of a, a lighter lime green. If you didn't know any difference, you could think that it was the same thing. This is one that was just done last year. So you can see it's a darker color. And if you the comparison over time, it will fade a little bit, just because, as I've said, 
these are natural dyes and natural dyes are not going to stay um, like you know they would nowadays. Here's another one, the Althea. I love my Altheas out here. And this one right here was done uh, again 10 or 12 years ago. Its color has stayed pretty well, but it stayed out of the light. This one was just you know done um, a year or so ago. The colors aren't really too different you know from these particular bags. But this is you know turned out uh, and has stayed. The color has stayed really well on it. Um, some of the other things that I've done. This is Larkspur, and I love Larkspur in early early spring. This is you know the blue that I have, and if you think about the way a larkspur grows, it grows just like this. And I wanted to uh, imitate what that plant would look like when I created this print. And so this probably took, I'm thinking probably about three hours. My husband was so glad he was gone that day because it took a long time because I had to decon, if you think about the way a larkspur grows, it has all those little flowers on, on stem. And so I had to take each one of those flowers off cut each one of the petals off of the flower and then re put, reposition them onto the fabric. So the way I did it, so I could keep the layered look is I would do like flowers, like every other flower on a stem, jump over a space, every other flower, and every other flower, take those down, hammer that down, and then I would come back and I would add petals to that. And then I would create another stem. And again, the same process where I would layer this upon layer. And then I came in and put the stem in as well. And this one does have a little bit of enhancement, if you can see that, um, where I, I just enhanced it with my permanent marker. So you can see the outline, the design of those petals as well. Um, this is, uh, you know, I think I label this frog fruit, but I think this is actually horse herb. But again, it's an interesting little plant. Um, it has a little tiny yellow bloom on it, and I really wanted that tiny yellow bloom. But it just would not come out when I was trying to pound it into it. So I ended up making this a mixed medium print by using a yellow highlighter. And so I imprinted the uh, petals onto the fabric and then I used my yellow highlighter and I marked that in there. And then I didn't necessarily like the stem on that particular plant. So again, I just drew them in. So this is my mixed medium um, print. Uh, my our artist friends uh, explained that that was something that I could do. So this is a, a pattern where I use just different kinds of daylilies. Um, again, uh, they're very interesting in their patterns as they're pulled apart and uh, you know the colors came out very, very interesting. Um, pull a couple over here. This is um, the bougainvillea and I love this one because it comes out with the color, the, the leaves came out on it as well. Um, again, I wasn't as crazy about the stem and those tend to be really woody. So I just used my little mixed medium and I drew a stem in there for it. <clears throat> this one is uh, Indian Blanket. And again, Indian Blanket, if you remember those plants, they're orange with yellow tips. And this one took a little while as well because I wanted this full pattern and I deconstructed every single one of those blooms and layered those layer upon layer and then just put one of my little uh, yellow flowers in there as well. And this one turned out uh, cute as well. This was just some little uh, daisies that I pulled out and pounded those in and, and created a, a pattern for those. Um, other things that you can do is you can actually create prints and then um, I had this idea that I wanted to uh, create some prints and put these above our headboard in our bedroom and um, my husband was kind of freaking out because he has terrible allergies. And so he was like, that's going to drop down on me and I'm going to smell it and I'm going to sneeze and all this stuff. I said, like, okay, don't worry about it. So I went to uh, Hobby Lobby and I was still using my 12 by 12. And I want you to know that 12 by 12 frames are not the easiest things to find. Oh, I love your dog. <laughs> and not the uh, cheapest things to purchase. But, you know, Hobby Lobby has those 40% coupons. And so you can certainly use those or you can order several. So I made a decision that I wanted to frame these prints. And I'm sure you all probably knew how to do this, but I you know, was practicing and learning. So I just got some mounting board and you can purchase some that actually has a, a, a sticker on the back of it. And it just, you just peel it away if you haven't used it. Or you can purchase mounting board and you can spray it and then you put the uh, fabric down on top of it and you position it there. So what I would do is I bought a big piece of it, I cut them, into the 12 by 12s that I needed for my uh, frames, and then I positioned these on there. One thing, and you may know this already, but 
what I learned is if you purchase, and it's a little bit more expensive, but not much, if you purchase the kind that where you peel it off and it already has the stick -em on it, you have more time to reposition your print. If you use the board and you use the spray on, stick on, uh, you don't have as much time to reposition that. <laughs> so just something to keep in mind if you choose to do that. But I positioned these, um, you know, I mounted them on the board and then I put them within the frame. And again, I just, I absolutely love these prints. And the darker pieces here, if you look in here, this is actual pieces of the bloom of the flower that are still there uh, within this frame. And it just gives me joy to know that um, I, I've extended the beauty of this particular bloom. Not necessarily its life, but its beauty is there that I will be able to enjoy for many, many years. And then to help my husband, um, I actually have some, you know, these come with, uh, they come with, um, glass in them so you can frame them with glass over the top of them and in that way um, you know that whatever debris or whatever plant material is still there is not going to fall out or people won't come along and touch it or anything like that and you could even put you know some higher end glass if you wanted UV glass or something like that in there you could certainly do that um, I just use well so um, one other interesting I played with this last year this is actually a large point, uh, Christmas poinsettia and so again, if you think about the way those things grow, um, I decided to take this apart as well. And this was layer upon layer as I created, recreated, you know, the flower on this particular print. So I just took it apart. I started with the um, uh, center of the plant. That was my choice. You could do it opposite, but I chose to start with the center of the plant and layered that down and pounded those in, got the colors out got the um, pieces out. And this was a red poinsettia, so you can see the colors came out kind of a, a purplish, there's a little bit of red down in there. And then the leaves came out really fascinating as well, if you can see those. And on the leaves, I ended up using the uh, rounded edge or that ball peen part of the hammer. So it gave a little bit of different definition um, to those leaves, if you can see that at all. So again, the tools that you have, you can create many, many things with them. So one more thing I wanna show you is if you want your print to last and let it be washable. This is, um, I created this by taking a, a print and actually it was this print right here. So this was the original flower of the picture that's on here. So just like this one, here is the print of this party hibiscus. And this actually happened to be a deep red. And so it came out this luscious purple. And so I took this print and I laid this on my printer and I scanned the picture into my computer. And then within the computer, I manipulated the picture just a little bit so it would fit on, uh, fit within an eight and a half by 11. So you can purchase fabric transfer paper. And no, I don't get any feedback, I'll uh, cut kickback on this either. But this is something that you can use. This is where you would create a print where you would want to put it on a t-shirt, on an apron. I did it on this bag. So you've created the print, <coughs> excuse me, you have this in your computer, you've scanned it in, you have it digitally in there. So you can then manipulate the picture and you can print it out onto this transfer paper. And then the transfer paper can be used to transfer your, the image that you created onto whatever you want it to be. It could be, on, I put it on this bag, you could put it on a t-shirt, on uh, an apron, anything, the sky's the limit for you. But this will make it more permanent. You created an original print and then you transferred it onto that transfer paper and that you did iron on and that created another image. So that about concludes everything that I have for today. Um, and do you have any questions? Yeah, I do. Um, well, first I'll show you, I tried, so this, these little purple guys here. Yeah. Crate myrtle for my yarn. Um, wow, I've never done like myrtle. hot pink color. Yeah. Like a deep, really pretty purple. Beautiful purple. And then these blue ones, I'm not sure what kind of flower this is, but it's kind of like a little weed looking guy. Okay. Mm -hmm. they're, they're real pretty, this dark blue. But I tried just because you said no gusts of glory, right? So I tried one of these real um, thick 
yellow flowers. And I just, yeah. there just like it was to see what would happen. And it was a total yeah. <laughs> like big yellow blob. <laughs> yeah. So you're, you're really right that you should definitely take them apart. I think it's yeah but the yeah. yellow color seems to have come out really well so i might try one and take it away. yeah that has been my experience is usually those yellow flowers come out pretty true to color yeah. um but yeah over the years you know our experience has been <coughs> excuse me if you will deconstruct that flower basically take it apart you know because you as you've you know saw there you kind of it kind of mushes all the colors together yeah but well it's almost like it was too uh moist like it just yeah if yeah. you've got several layers, like if, you know, this, uh, you know, this uh, sunflower that I have right here, if I were to take this thing, let's see if I can turn it down. Yeah. You know, that's got several layers of blooms on it. If I were to lay all of those together, you know, I, I wouldn't see any definition. So, right. but, you know, again, it's personal preference. You know, are you looking for color? Are mm -hmm. you looking for definition? You know, I, my taste has kind of evolved um, to, I love the definition of the petals and what they're yeah. showing me. You know, to me, that's the essence of that flower. You know, that's a one mm -hmm. of a kind. You know, <laughs> no one else will recreate that one. And so that's what I like to see. But again, it's personal preference. You know, you create your own art. So my question is, um, the changing color, is it due to the chemicals or is it the hammering process? <clears throat> well, I think it's due to, I've done a little bit of research on this. I keep thinking I need to contact a, a true horticulturist that can tell me why all these colors change. But from what I've read, it is whatever is in that fabric that will draw it out uh, and then that, you know, transfers the color into it. But it also allows the color then to be uh, absorbed into the fibers of that fabric. Mm -hmm. but yeah. Hmm. I need to learn more about the scientific background of why those colors change. Well, Maybe it certainly I'll learn looks cool. <laughs> Yeah. Maybe one of our listeners will know. Yeah. But they come out fascinating. You know, like I said, it's a fun thing to do. Anybody can do it with a minimal amount of uh, items at home. Um, you know, even if you don't have a lot of flowers in your yard, you know, if you have trees, you know, mm -hmm. bushes, you can go out and look at the limbs. As long as the the leaves are not too dense. I mean, like a wax myrtle, something that has a waxy surface to it is not going to work very well. Um, you need something, you know, like these leaves off some of these uh, balloons here. This is uh, off of uh, rock rose. And, you know, a lot of times the native blooms do really, really well. The leaves do really well for whatever reason. There's not a lot of uh, wax on them. And these have great definition on the stems as well. And again, you can do either the front side of these or you can do the back side, um, depending on what it is you're trying to achieve out of that plant. The back side, sometimes the veining is a little bit more prominent than on the front of it. But if you, um, you know, like you've learned, if you just keep pounding, you can get that out of there. So to do it on paper is it a different anything? No, you. Uh, it's the same process. I went ahead and uh, put a. Uh, a bloom down here. I think this was one of my uh, impatiens, and it's just the same process. You just uh, lay that down onto the paper, and you put a piece of tape over it. And I'm going to hammer this. But I'm not going to be real happy with this because I see it's already splattered. So um, it didn't do. This is not a very good quality uh, paper and it pulled, you might want to use painting uh, tape on those. So what I ended up getting was I got color, but I didn't get definition on those. I had separated the petals on them, but they didn't come out very well. So with so the paper, it does, it, does it bleed through like the fabric does, or does it do? This is, well, it, because this is not a high quality watercolor paper, it's more of a uh, cardstock, and so therefore it's not going to absorb as much of the oh, okay. of the uh, moisture that's in there. I'm going to do this leaf real quick and we're going to see what happens with it. And again, because I'm using masking tape, it may pull some of my paper. So you might want to use painter's tape on this. Um, so it won't pull the paper off when you're pulling it apart when you've taken it off. Now this is interesting. I had not tried this before. This was a leaf from uh, Rock Rose. And so it didn't give me a lot of color, 
but it gave me an interesting leaf design. Can you see that at all? Yeah. It has a really, it, up close, you can see that it gave me a very distinct leaf pattern on that. So, you know, the downside is when I did that petal, that had so much moisture in it, that it gave me a blob. <coughs> Excuse me, but the leaf, it gave me a very distinct leaf pattern. So you're going to do, if you want to make a card or something on paper, you're gonna to want to experiment with that a little bit more to see what uh, flowers, and you may have to do like one petal at a time, because I had all of those petals on there, even though I had them separated, uh, they still kind of just splattered when I did it. So just be cautious when you're gonna do, do it on paper. So I feel like you need fresh flower to get the, the ink, the color to come through. But if you let the flower dried out a little bit, would you have less of that kind of blob bleeding? Well, but you might have less color as well. Yeah. Um, what I've, I've experienced with, um, because I've exper uh, experimented with how long I can let a cut flower go before I have to use it. Yeah. Um, you know, like I'm sitting here with these flowers in front of me and um, like the uh, tropical hibiscus, it still looks pretty fresh. But, you know, I've got this poor little uh, petunia that is not happy at all. And these were all cut about the same time. You know, I did it about 30 minutes before this class mm -hmm. and they're not happy. So you can't, uh, you can't let them go with, you know, cause you could sit them in water. Um, you know, if you cut them on a stem, which, you know, if you're gonna keep this for any length of time, you would probably wanna do that. Just like I have these flowers here. Right, yeah. Um, yeah, like yours are, you know, that's going to keep that moisture going up into that flower. Um, because, you know, as soon as I cut those flowers off of the stem, they're going to start losing their moisture pretty quickly. Yeah. You know, this one's not bad because, you know, it had a pretty dense stem on it, you know, that maintains some of the moisture. Um, these others, my poor little um, petunia, he's just not happy at all. He's just kind of wilting right there. So. All right, any other questions? No, I'm really excited to just play with it and, you know, do all the different things and see what I can make with it. It just seems Absolutely. like a all cool, right. um, way to do a lot of different things, so. Absolutely. You know, and it's an easy thing, like I said, to teach others. Um, you have all of these supplies around your house. Even the fabric is not that difficult to treat. You know, I would give yourself a couple of days if you're going to, you know, treat the fabric because it does take a little bit of time for stuff to soak and dry and all of that. Um, but it's not hard, you know. Right. And these are products, these are items that you can get at the grocery store. Like I said, the alum, a little container. This is, uh, you can find this in the uh, spice aisle. And it comes in these little containers. It's about a 1.9 ounce, but you'll, for one yard of fabric, you'll use this entire amount. And then the uh, the washing soda, again, this is at your local store as well. Just go where you find any other detergent. And these are the two products that you would need to uh, properly um, prepare your fabric. Um, things I've read, I really, I, I like using muslin, so I haven't experimented with much of other things, but, you know, they do talk about that you can use wool and silk and things like that, and if you um, are a, an artist or you're adventurous, you know, get up there and try it. So that's the purpose of this class, is really just to teach you the basics and then inspire you and encourage you to go and do more. Definitely. Um, all right, are we good? Yeah, thanks, Nancy. I hope you have all enjoyed trying your flower pounding, and please take pictures of what you've been able to make and share them with us. We want to see what you've been able to make. Um, I'm excited to play with it, and I hope you are too. So thanks so much for joining us. All right, thank you.